Good morning, and welcome to Moments with Melinda. I am your host, Melinda Moulton. And today, my guest is Steph Yu. Hi, Steph. How are you? Hi, I'm good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you so much for agreeing to be on my show. Let me tell my viewers a little bit about you. Um, Steph is the executive director and president of the Public Asset Institute, where she focuses on advancing economic security for all Vermonters. That's a big, that's a big job. It is. It is. And how long have you been in this position? So I've only been the executive director since the beginning of 2023, but I've been with public assets for nine years now. Right, right. That's true. I, I read that about you. Um, so uh, let's start at the beginning. Um, tell us a little bit about where you grew up and about your early childhood, Steph. Wow. Okay. Um, so I am a uh, I've been in New England for a long time, although with stints other places. I grew up in a small town in Massachusetts, Westminster. I, there's another Westminster look in Vermont, too, I think. But, you know, small town, 5,000 people, far from Boston, far from sort of any of the the uh, the East Coast traffic. Um, so similar in a lot of ways to lots of parts of Vermont, but really didn't know much about Vermont. Um, you know, really hadn't been here before we moved here. So, um, so, so what, so what brought you, what brought you to Vermont? Well, so let me just say that we weren't, we didn't, you know, my, I didn't really have roots in, in Massachusetts. We moved there when I was a baby. My, my father is an immigrant, uh, a Chinese immigrant who grew up in the Philippines and my mother's a Midwesterner. So, um, no real ties to New England, but for me, it's home. Um, and the, so we had moved around a lot since then. You know, I grew up here and then my my parents left Massachusetts when I was in college. And then I've sort of lived all over the place in, in a number of states, California, New York, Michigan, West Virginia. Um, and so and and abroad and then found ourselves back here, um, back in New England and happy to be back. Definitely miss the snow and the fall and all those things. So what what brought you back to New England? What what was the impetus that brought you back here? I think it does. I think New England is home. My my husband's from grew up in Maine as well. And so I think there were some ties here, although most of our family isn't here anymore. Um, but uh, we do still have some family ties here. And I think, um, you know, our kids, so our kids were little when we moved back here. The, the oldest had just finished kindergarten and the, the younger one was three, I think. So we like the idea of raising our kids in New England and coming back to um, like I say, the seasons and and the schools and sort of the, some of the things that I think really draw people to Vermont. And and it's Vermont. It's not just New England. You came back to Vermont. Yeah. So you know, part of it was was it's always a challenge to for for both uh, both partners to find jobs in a new place. Especially my husband's a professor, so there's always limited options for academics in any given in any given year. But uh, we knew we wanted to be back in in the Northeast, and we were we were pretty open. But we were very excited about Vermont. I think partly because, um, you know, we don't miss the traffic in in I don't miss the traffic in Boston. I don't miss that those pieces. And we love you know we love cross country skiing. We love the outdoor piece. So that was definitely a big pull. Or the drivers in Boston. They can be a little they can be a little rude. It can so, be a little much. Yeah. yeah thank, so thank you for sharing that, because I always like my viewers to start at the beginning and share a little bit about their up, upbringing. Um, so who would you say had the greatest impact on your life and helping you find your place in the work that you're doing today? I think it's a lot. I think it's a combination of a lot of things. I mean, probably my parents, most of all, sort of single biggest influence, I think, in most in a lot of lives. Um, but I do think that experience of being, you know, where I grew up in Massachusetts was small rural town. There were no other families of color. You know, my father, my Chinese father was was the only person um, in town that, you know, the only the only immigrant in town, probably. And um, and so I think that really shaped this sort of sense of um, kind of both the sense of sort of a bigger world and also the sense of um recognizing what it's like to sort of be outside of a lot of that of a lot of sort of the the mainstream culture or community of a of a place um so i think that was a big part of it but i think it was also just you know really really raising us with the idea that we should be contributing that we should be doing something to help people um and i think that got reinforced throughout my years in various places you know i think um 
our time during our time in West Virginia, I was running the state's AmeriCorps programs. And that's a very, you know, it's a very different culture. There's a lot of regional differences, but it's also parts of the world that have really been left behind for a long time. And so I think that also sort of reinforced the, the, you know, the systemic nature of a lot of these challenges, as well as the, the reasons why different communities get deliberately excluded or left behind. So I think all of that sort of contributed to getting here. Fascinating. Um, so, so is that, is that what inspired you to get into serving and supporting the social network for more marginalized communities? I mean, what was the impetus for you to decide to, to serve uh, these communities? I mean, I think that I, yes, I think that's, that's largely, that's largely right. I think, you know, recognizing sort of um, the challenge that that people of color have faced in this country for a long time, particularly black Americans, um, but also immigrants and sort of looking at the ways in which, you know, we're seeing, we're seeing that now kind of the waves of anti-immigrant uh, sentiment that have sort of permeated, you know, as long as I've been alive and certainly before that. Right. Um, so I think that was part of it. I think that, like I say, I think having worked in the corporate side of things and having worked for a couple of different state governments and 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 seeing some of the same sort of systemic patterns repeated in different places and under different circumstances and really starting to think about how how our communities function, how our society functions in terms of what you know, who's who's making money off of what and where is how is power being consolidated and really kind of thinking about those things. I think it sort of leads you to the conclusion that um, government should be a force for good, hasn't always been. And yet it's the best tool we have to have the communities that we want. So really focusing on policy as the way to to create the, the communities we want. Um, now, you are a member of the Vermont Professionals of Color Network. Can you talk to us about this group? Uh, yes. And actually, I just joined the board as of October. Uh, it's a great group. I've been so excited to I've sort of been watching from the beginning as this group has gotten off the ground. And it's an amazing group and I think has the right idea. You know, this was part of what I was thinking about growing up as you're as you're sort of activating the childhood memories. I think growing up in Massachusetts and feeling really isolated as a kid of color and feeling really isolated, um, you know, at that time and place. Um, and so, and I think that happens for a lot of people of color in Vermont, you know, there's a relatively small population, we're still one of the least diverse states. And I think it can be very isolating. There, you know, there's a bit, there's a bit of a community in Chittenden County, but certainly in other parts of the state, I think there's both a, a sense of isolation and a real sense of, of hyper visibility, right, that, that um, you stand out in a lot of ways. And so, um, so I think what professionals of color are, are VTPOC is trying to do is really some great stuff. There's a there's a couple of different layers. One, it's about connection and building communities. Two, that professional piece is a is a broad definition, right? It's an inclusive definition of what we mean by professional. Anybody working, uh, and so really thinking about that and recognizing that a lot of us have never had mentors of color, right? Leadership positions are so often filled with with white men, sometimes white women, but but. What does that look like to really mentor the next generation and develop leadership? And so another part of the professional of, professionals of color work is really is looking at mentoring high school students and, and making sure that people understand that there's a path and that there's other people out there that they can talk to and that there are people in in every sector uh, in Vermont that that, you know, can give them support, can give them guidance, can just listen, you know, all of the above. So I think we're really trying to do some great work. And I give so much credit to, to Weiwei and Tino, the co-executive directors who have done, who have just, you know, taken this from a nothing to a pretty great something. Well, how do I, how do my viewers get involved? What's the website? How do they get involved? So it's vtpoc.org. VP. POC, so Vermont Professionals of Color. Um, and, you know, members are welcome and membership can look like a whole lot of, a, a whole lot of, um, of things, you know, it can be just participating in some of the community events. There's a lot of just get togethers just for, you know, communal space. There's some communal working events. There's also a lot of trainings that people can sign up for. So webinars on a whole bunch of things, you know, if you're working in a nonprofit world, how can we be helpful if you're trying to get a federal grant? You know, what does it look like? What's available to the state? So whole range of, of ways to get involved Absolutely. in as, as much as or as little as we might want, I think. 
which so to my viewers, if you're interested, please go to the Vermont Professionals of Color Network uh, website and get involved if you're so inclined. Now, let's move on to your present work. You are the executive director of the Public Assets Institute. So can you talk to us about this organi organization and what your mission and goals are? So our mission is to improve the economic well-being of all Vermonters, and by that we mean all people in the state, um, whether they think of themselves as Vermonters or not, um, or whether they're what you think of when you hear that word or not. Um, and and we do that, and, and that's about racial equity, it's about social equity, it's about economic equity, all of those fights. And we've really been thinking a lot about economic security and, and thinking about what it means to have economic security across your lifetime and in any circumstances. So I think we saw in the pandemic, some of this at work, you know, more money going into people's pockets, more housing dollars, plenty of food, um, food dollars going in and what it can look like when we're actually committed to making sure that everybody has enough. So that's the work of it. Uh, what we do in practice is a lot of um, crunching numbers, uh, Excel spreadsheets, trying to make charts pretty and interesting to people, which is really, you know, which is definitely kind of braids my interest because I do appreciate um, good data visualization and really kind of trying to chase down what's true about what's happening. Um, so that's our work. And, you well, know, there's there's so much more that we could more to do than we could possibly do. But we're trying. We're gonna, we're gonna dig a little deeper into all of this. So so I so appreciate the work that you do. It's just, it's been, ex it's extraordinary to do this research on you and this organization. So Steph, as a result of the current election and the harsh outcomes marginalized Americans will be experiencing under a Trump administration, how will your work protect them? Uh, so so this was this has been a big part of what we've been thinking about. Um, a lot of our work, and I, I will give um, Vermont policymakers some credit. I think that there has been a real effort, particularly during the pandemic work and over the last couple of years, um, by both the administration and the legislature legislature to be inclusive in policies, right? A lot of the federal uh, pandemic aid only went to citizens. There was a real effort in Vermont to expand some of that, to put up state dollars, to expand those programs to uh, people without documentation. And I think that that has been really positive. At the same time, we've also, we also recognize that we're a border state and that the, the present, you know, there is a presence here of, um, of border security and and can make life difficult for folks. So I think there's so I think, you know, I give credit in the sense that I think that there is that it's not just us who are concerned about protecting people um, regardless of immigration status. And but I think that that is a big part of of where the concern is. I spent last week actually in D.C. So we also have counterpart organizations in most other states and for I think we're in 42 states now. Uh, who do similar work at the state policy level to us. And then there we have a federal partner who does this, a national partner who does this work at the federal level and helps to kind of bring us together and, and just make sure we're connected when there's other states that are sort of facing the same problem and that kind of thing. But part of that conversation was really about what is it going to look like when communities are really under threat? Immigrant communities, LGBT, LGBTQ communities, you know, there's a lot. I think those are the those are sort of media concerns, but certainly um, BIPOC folks writ large uh, have a lot of concerns, understandable concerns about what it's going to look like. I mean, we saw what happened under the first administration, which, you know, was was maybe less um, less prepared for the work. Um, so I think there's the first is to is to keep talking about the ways in which we need to help uh, protect v Vermonters without without documentation and really recognize that they're a critical part of our communities, that they're paying taxes, that they're part of our workforce, that they're that th that they're a part of Vermont. And I think that that, you know, like I say, I think the, the good news is that there's a lot of support for that. Mm -hmm. um, and and I think it continues to be to sort of fight for the resources for um, for everyone. I also think there's a democratic element to this, to our work, you know, a, a promotion of democracy and democratic values to our work that maybe is not as obvious as some of our other work, but I think is really critical. So, you know, Vermont likes to pride itself on town meeting day. We have community involvement. And yet I think there's still a lot of ways where we could be more engaged, be having better conversations, and be really seeing government as a tool of the people to get the state that we want. And I think some of our work is in 
you know, the boring stuff of the process of that. What does that look like to be weighing in on the actual state budget and to have more community involvement in that? And I think it's also sort of some of the, the you know, it's the real policy work too, but it's also some of the conceptual and cultural work of, you know, what does it look like to participate and what does it look to look like to listen to each other and to spend the time and have the relationships. And frankly, I think it should be a state, you know, a part of state government is that public engagement infrastructure should be there. There's been people in the past, but it's not, it could be better, right? It could be better. Well, I'm going to move on here to the work of the Public Assets Institute because it includes listening to Vermonters on how our state can work better for them. So how do my viewers reach out to you with their voices to share their thoughts? How can my viewers engage in the Public Assets Institute? Well, we always love to hear from people. Believe it or not, we're not bombarded with messages from people. So we do appreciate the ones that we get. Um, you know, a lot of people do react to our work and send us emails or comments or, you know, engage in, so in social media in that way. But we also appreciate the sort of more in-depth conversations. I will say I've been doing a couple of, um, we try to do outreach outreach tours pretty regularly and participate in community events of our partners and do that across the state. One thing that I've been doing recently, actually, is I've been... Um, Bess O'Brien has this film just getting by and she's been on tour with this. It's about housing and food insecurity in Vermont. And I've been going with her to a number of screenings to have these conversations about what we do at the policy level to address some of what you're seeing on screen, uh, which has been great and has brought us to a lot of places and people who weren't, who aren't necessarily um, following our work or, or very engaged in state policy, but who appreciate the storytelling that Bess is able to do. So that's one piece. Um, similarly, we've gotten involved with the Vermont Reads program this year because the book is so pertinent. The Gather, which is an a, a great story and, uh, you know, well, yeah, just beautifully written, but also, you know, accessible, a young adult book accessible to anybody and but really paints the picture of ways in which our systems are failing kids mm -hmm. and families. And so we've been participating, we, you know, we're 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 on the docket to participate in a number of community conversations around that. And we just, you know, we we go wherever. I've been to school boards, I've been to PTOs, I've been to any of these things. So if there are community events that we can be useful or just you'd like to, you'd like us to hear the conversation, please reach out. Thank you so much. Um, so to my viewers, the Public Assets Institute website is www.publicassets.org. And it is filled with really interesting and important information. And, um, and there is a video on your website, which is deeply informative, by the way. Uh, it's called Property Tax Relief for Vermonters, your mm -hmm. three-part plan. Mm -hmm. And can you just share a bit of the thinking behind this plan? Because so many are struggling to handle this 14% increase in their property taxes, Steph. Yeah. So I think two things can be true, which is that Vermonters can want good public schools and quality education for their kids and not be able to cope with higher property taxes, you know? And, and so one of the things that we've identified as we've been doing a lot of this work, so we have a, Vermont has a unique education funding system. It's a statewide system. It's different than most other states where things are raised at the local level and it's really more of a local. And so you see in other states, you see really a lot of disparity between wealthy towns and less wealthy ones. And in Vermont, we have this, we have income sensitivity, which allows more people to pay based on income. Uh, most Vermont homeowners pay some or all of their, their bill based on income and not based on the property rate. But what's been happening is that we haven't changed those thresholds for income sensitivity in a long time. And so more and more Vermonters are being in, are being put in this position of having to pay both an income-based piece and a property-based piece. And as property values keep going up, that property piece gets bigger and bigger and really is is pretty out of whack. And what that means, and ultimately middle-class Vermonters are paying the largest share, larger than high-income Vermonters. And income sensitivity helps for low-income Vermonters. I think it does make um, school taxes more manageable, but again, it's gotten out of whack. So our plan is really to update those thresholds so that income sensitivity does what it was intended to do, which is make sure that people can afford to pay their school taxes. Thank you, that's really important. So I also loved your website. Again, it's publicassets.org. I really encourage my viewers to visit your website. It hosts a lot of fabulous charts and graphs, which I'm a very visual learner. And I, and I love graphs and I love numbers. And it really you know, gets down to the meat of the issue by using um, that kind of analytical tool. 
Um, but it helps to explain the state of our economic realities here in Vermont. And what is the state and local taxes as a share of family income? And you state that Vermont is one of the few states where the tax system does not make inequality worse. Can you expand on that? Sure. So in most states, um, so states have a variety of, of tax systems. Vermont has what we like to call the three-legged stool of consumption taxes, property taxes, and income taxes. And those are sort of the big three taxes that that, that most states use some combination of and the federal government, right? Well, the federal government doesn't really have property taxes. But but the point is that we we try to have this mix of taxes and in, in a lot of states, the income tax is progressive, meaning that you pay a larger share, the higher your income. But sales tax tends to be regressive, meaning that that lower income people are going to pay a bigger share because you, you have to buy a certain amount of stuff and it takes a bigger bite out of a smaller budget. Mm -hmm. So sales taxes tend to be really regressive. So the, so states that rely more on sales taxes and less on income taxes tend to have regressive systems, meaning that they are exacerbating in, income inequality. They're making the gap bigger between the lower income and the higher income because they're asking lower income to pay a larger share in taxes. Property taxes also tend to be regressive, part, you know, because partly because you can only buy such, you know, there are only the houses that are available only get so expensive relative to your income. You can have sort of unlimited income, but there's sort of a limit to how much you're going to spend on on your on your property. Um, so so but in Vermont, because of income sensitivity, our property tax our school taxes are this mix of income based and property taxes. So our, our school, our property taxes are less regressive, particularly at the low income end, although they're still regressive at the high end. So the combination results in a system that's mostly progressive, but just a little regressive at the top. And which is better than a lot of states. You know, there are some states, like I say, who don't have income taxes, who rely wholly on sales taxes or property taxes and really hit lower income folks in the states harder. Isn't that like Florida? That's why a lot of Vermonters yeah, I mean, there's a surprising, there's a surprise. So Florida relies a lot on property taxes, right? And doesn't have an income tax, as we keep hearing about. And yet, I'll point out, as we always have to in these conversations, is that just as many people come come to Vermont from Florida as go to Florida from Vermont. It's just that we don't know them. So we, we're, we're, we'll have a new, an updated report on some of the state to state migration in January. Oh, great. Well, make sure you share that with me. Um, so you have you have some great campaigns that your organization uh, is doing. And like the anti-poverty tax credits for a strong Vermont, fair share for Vermont, which can be seen on your website, publicassets.com backslash campaign. Talk to us about a couple of these initiatives that you're working on. So the fair share for Vermont campaign um, is a coalition based, they're all coalition based work. We we work with partners on pretty much every issue. And that's a, that's a sort of a critical value. I think that we're not going it alone on this stuff. But the fair share for Vermont campaign has been working for a couple of years now to, um, again, correct that regressivity in our tax code. So we do have this regressivity at the top to correct that, to make our system wholly progressive. And what that looks like is raising the income tax on higher income Vermonters, because that's a progressive piece of our, our, our tax code. That's where we want to go. And when we say high income, we mean people making more than $500,000 a year. So one under 2% of Vermont taxpayers we're talking about, but that's the correction there. And there's some great work. There's a lot of great partners involved in that work. Um, and you know, and Steph, there are a lot of Vermonters who are willing to pay that. There's a lot of, well, not only that, but there's also just broad support across the board, right? And and we've had wealthy Vermonters sign on because they believe that we should have a progressive system. You're here. Yep, yep. And then the anti-poverty tax credit work is also, you know, as I, I was referring to this expanding of some of our tax credits to folks without documentation, but Vermont has a state child tax credit as of 2022, which is great. Um, I think it was partly to kind of fill the whole left, you know, the feds expanded their child tax credit during the pandemic and then dialed it back down and Vermont wanted to step up a bit. So we have, we have a good um, child tax credit. It only applies to kids under six. We'd like to expand that to all kids. Um, and then we also, the earned income tax credit, Vermont has, has a fairly robust state earned income tax credit, but especially for single folks, people without dependents, it's pretty small and it doesn't make a huge difference. And what we're what we're finding, we're actually in the middle of our working on our year end state of working Vermont report. And what we're finding is that 
single people, whether they have kids or not, are really struggling to make ends meet. A lot of that is the cost of housing, a lot of other factors. But bottom line is that we really want to beef up, beef up that piece for the earned income tax credit for uh, folks without dependents, because it really is not, you know, it could be making a much bigger difference than it is. Right. And it'll help bring young people to the state, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Um. So, Steph, what would your advice be for those who are fearful for our future, for the future of our country and the future of our planet? What would your advice be, especially um, to young people? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think the advice is keep going. Right. I mean, now's the time. I think I think more than ever state policy matters, I'll say more than ever right now. I think we can do things as a state that we can't um, that might be harder at the national level. I also, you know, I, you know, Vermont likes to think of itself as exceptional sometimes in some ways, but I do think being a small state has advantages and disadvantages. But one of the advantages is that, you know, we do have community ties. We we can have these conversations, I think, in ways, and we can take matters into our own hands in ways that it would be harder in a bigger state, I think. So I think the bottom line is keep going. If you're, if you're, you know, I think for us, we believe in this work. We believe, um, you know, we believe that this work is important and, you know, everybody should be, should have economic security and we have the resources to make it happen in Vermont. So I think the answer is keep going. It doesn't help if you look away. It doesn't help if you give up. That's what I keep telling myself anyway. But keep going. There's so been some bad moments. One step in front of the other. Um, again, to my viewers, uh, Steph Yu is the executive director and president of Public Assets Institute. Their website is publicassets.org. I encourage you to go to that website and get involved. Um, Steph is there to listen to you and wants to hear what you have to say about the state of Vermont's economy um, and how we can do better. So um, Steph, your leadership of the Public Asset Institute is really a valuable gift for the state. Your core functions, from what I understand from your website, are watchdog, myth-busting, power building and research and development. And the goal of your organization is to create a state where everyone can thrive. Uh, to my viewers, there's also a donate button on the website. And uh, I'm assuming that uh, it's important to support your work from private donations. So I encourage our viewers to go to that donate button and support this work because it really does help all of us. Um, so thank you, Steph, so much for being on my show. And I'd Thank love to you you again when some of these studies come out so we can dive deep into them and and uh, and learn more from what, from the work that you're doing and the group that you're doing. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Sounds great. All right. And to my viewers, I wish you a beautiful day and a beautiful holiday, and I'll see you shortly. Bye-bye. <laughs>